This is January the 1st, 2017, the beginning of, according to our current calendar, the beginning of the new year. And this lesson is from Unit 2. It is lesson number 5 and very befitting title from the standard lesson commentary. Our lesson's title is Praise God for Creation. Our devotional reading is Psalms number 146. Our background scripture is Psalms 33 verses 1 through 9. And our printed text is the same, Psalms 33, verses 1 through 9. Our key verse is Psalms 33, verse 6, and it reads, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Our lesson's aims are to list some reasons to praise the Lord and rejoice in him, describe worship as a function of God's creation, and suggest one way that his or her church can improve the worship experience. Our lesson is quite fitting since we have come to the end of one year and the beginning of a new year. And it is fitting on various reasons and purposes. Oh, number 33 of the Psalms is actually resounding a practice that was normal during the biblical times. Uh, this number, Psalms, is actually related to the end of a period of harvest. And during biblical times where there was almost an opposite in the percentage of the people that were in an agrarian age or an agrarian practice. Many people in the biblical time were uh, farm people. They raised their crops and they herded the cattle and the sheep and goats. And so they had a very in tuned inclination to nature uh, to God's uh, purposes and provisions provided through the harvest of the land. And Psalms 33 actually speaks to the people rejoicing and giving praise unto God for coming to the end of the harvest and receiving the provisions and receiving the yield of that which was sown in the land, and now they're reaping the harvest. And because of seeing through God's creation that following God's purpose, planting and sowing seeds, and then receiving the yield of what was planted, they engaged into an annual practice of worshiping and praising God for the harvest, for the fulfillment of the harvest. And this is why it is so fitting for this lesson, our fifth uh, lesson out of Unit 2, at the beginning of the start of our calendar year, where we can reflect back over 2016 and see the provisions that God has already prepared and made for us from the beginning 
up unto the end. And we can look back to what God has done and where God has brought us from just in this past year. And so where we look at what scripture is saying, where it says, Rejoice in the Lord, all ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Now, when we look at that, we recognize the word rejoice. And the rejoice is not a solemn or a quiet or a somewhat uh, serene type of practice. But it is joyous, it is vibrant, it is loud. And the commentary reflects us to Psalms 98 and 4 and Psalms 81 and 1 where it says to sing aloud, to make a joyous noise unto the Lord because this is comely for the upright. Now, comely, biblically speaking, explains to us that this means that this is suitable for the upright, that this is befitting for the upright, that it's becoming for the upright. It's even honorable for the upright to rejoice in the Lord and to sing praises unto the Lord and to do it with exuberance for us to be uh, actively and lively involved in the praise of God. For what? For all the things that God has done, is doing, and promises that God will complete. And we know that God's promises are fulfilled and are real based upon what God has already done. So when we look at this and we speak of praise, we do want to lift a very good note uh, from that first verse. We want to lift a very good note in the commentary, uh, which is good food for thought. And this is spiritual food that we're partaking of now. Uh, this part, though, we lift where it says people are not made righteous by their praise of God, but praising him is right and the proper thing to do. So sometimes we can't get lost in the fact that if we live sinful lives all through the week, or in this case, all through the year. But at the culmination of that year, we engage in praise unto God that that does not make us righteous, although the praise is still rightly due unto God. So uh, we don't want to be misdirected uh, in the scripture as though if you just participate in the praise, that that somehow cleanses you of all of your wrongdoings. Repentance does that, and submitting to God's will and following the utterance of the Spirit, that does that. That is what brings us into God's will. But not just that we sing aloud or that we play an instrument or that we're in the choir or that we jump up and down in the congregation in harmony with the praise service that is going on. It's the life that we live. That's the real praise that's given unto God. Now, if we indeed are going to participate in the rejoicing and the praise of the self-created one, Almighty God. Then verse 2 and 3 gives us a small, uh, gives us a small representation of 
what instrument and how this should be done. Now, it, it only lists two instruments, and that's the harp and the psaltery. These two instruments are stringed instruments, but we know from other passages in the book of Psalms that many instruments were listed. But just these two stringed instruments are listed here. And as we identify these two instruments, we also must lift this. And uh, sometimes we are involved in certain practices and certain uh, expressions in our worship experience, not really fully realizing the potential that they contain. But even in healing in medical fields today, they are using music, string instruments, to soothe the spirit of patients who are being devastated by certain illnesses, life-threatening illnesses, and have found results in the healing process from so-called terminal illnesses by stringed instruments and other instruments that God has provided to his people for praise and worship. So when we engage in the practice of rendering song in a worship experience, we should also be mindful of the potentiality that exists in those instruments. Now, one of the things that's listed in the commentary here speaks to us about how these instruments should be played. And that's in verse 3, and it says, Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. I want to stop right here just to reflect on the first part of verse 3 and then the second part. Sing unto him a new song. Now, this does not uh, indicate that every time we open our mouths to sing uh, praises unto God, that it has to be a new song. But it should be sung with a new spirit, that we should not engage in singing songs, whether they are familiar or unfamiliar, and get into the practice of, oh, we sing this song all the time, and now here we go again. And, and it, don't, don't, don't we have another song that we could sing? No, sing the song with a vibrant spirit. Sing the song with the renewing, with the refreshing. Play the song skillfully. Um, we unfortunately have had instances or occurrences in worship experiences where people uh, jump on to certain instruments uh, in the house of God and engage in the playing with, uh, of the instruments and it becomes a clatter, a noise, but it is not real praise. And here, the Psalms is telling us to play skillfully with a loud noise. That it should, we should practice. I can't just come and just uh, walk into the place of worship and pick an instrument up and just begin to start plucking strings or beating onto the animal skins or touching keys on the keyboard, but I have to engage into that practice skillfully. I have to, I have to take on that mission of being an instrument in God's worship experience, playing my instrument skillfully. Now, there's some other commentaries here that we also want to lift. And this here speaks to how this new song should be rendered. 
And it just says, as they sang such a song, the instrumentalists are to hold nothing back in terms of skill, volume, or joyous exuberance. Then it goes on to tell us that over the top exuberance is not the same as uncontrolled chaos. For the musical expression of singers and notes to blend harmoniously implies that skill, their skill that comes from rehearsal. Again, we don't just run in and jump on the instrument because I had a dream and thought I could play. But it is through rehearsal. It is through horning, perfecting our skill and never being satisfied with whatever level we obtain, but always trying to get to a higher level and a higher expression in these worship experiences. It does go on to inform us that, but the motive behind rehearsal is important. Wrong motives put the professionalism of the music first, Right motives put the meaning, meaningful uh, fullness of the worship experience first. Let me make that comparison again. Wrong motives put the professionalism of the musicians first. Right motives put the meaningfulness of the worship experience first. Now, verse 4 a, B, and 5, A, and B, give us a guideline of what we should be praising God for. And it first tells us, for the word of the Lord is right. Number one. Number two, and all his works are done in truth. Number three, he loves righteousness and judgment. And number four, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Now, when we think about for the word of the Lord is right, a real key point is lifted here in our commentary. And it says to us, what we say in worship is important, and it should not be approached carelessly. It is not profitable for the church to sing words that contain unbiblical sentiments or misleading doctrinal statements. We guard against such errors by careful study of scripture in order to derive song lyrics from the Bible itself. In addition to skillfully playing your instrument, we also need to know what scripture says so that we don't find ourselves being gifted to participate in the worship experience of God, but sending the wrong message while we are trying to participate in God's worship experience. So in addition to playing our instruments, we also need to be studying the word of God so that when we render songs of worship unto God, we are in tune with what we believe according to scripture. And then where it speaks to us concerning about all of his works are done in truth. When it says for all God's works are done in truth, it means that God's words are always true and trustworthy. His actions are as well. God is consistent in the way he deals with humanity. Now, this was a key part in the commentary. It says, but in spite of human sin, and all too often unwillingness to repent, God still loves the sinner deeply. 
His works are consistent with and speak of both his love for us and his holy insistence that we abandon sinful ways. Now, when we begin to speak of God's love for righteousness and judgment, uh, it speaks to us that we should reflect on Psalms 92, I mean, sorry, Psalms 97 and verse 2 that tells us that righteousness and judgment are the habitation of God's throne. Now, what I would like to lift to that would be out of the uh, 19th Psalms, verses 9, 10, and 11. And it reads in this light, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yes, more than much fine gold, and sweeter also they are than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Now, when we speak of the fear of the Lord, uh, we don't serve a God that uh, joys in us being afraid of God. That's not the translation of the word fear. But it is better to read the translation than the word itself because the word is used as reverential trust, reverential trust. So the reverential trust of the Lord is clean. It is pure. It is enduring forever. And so when we think about God's righteousness and we think about God's judgment, it just simply means righteousness to do what is right. Judgments being just as in treating others fairly. Now, I know it is difficult for some of us to imagine that it is humanly possible for us to do what is right and for us to be just in our dealings, for us to treat others fairly. But that would be to forsake that there is a godly spirit that dwells in us. And text, scripture tells us, know ye not that your body is the temple of God and that the spirit dwells within us? So uh, we can rely on fleshly choices and then we will reap the benefit of those actions or we can attend to the spiritual things and then reap the benefits of the spirit. And so when the scripture says to us that if the servant, these things are being offered as warnings to us as servants of the Lord, then it says, and in keeping them, there is great reward. So if we follow and practice what we preach and what we say, then we will reap the benefits that God has already stored up and laid up for us. Now, we want to come to uh, the latter part of our lesson, uh, which speaks to us about the praise for his works. Now, earlier we were speaking of the praise by the upright, but now we want to look at the praise for his works. And this here is beginning 
in verse 6. And it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And he gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap and he laid up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth reverently trust the Lord. It says, fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Now, just as we try and bring this to a close, when we speak of all the heavens and everything they're in, uh, just being created by God, and it was just by his speaking. He spoke things into being that the word of God itself is activity. The word of God itself is fulfillment. The word of God itself brings things into being. When we look at verse 19, of Psalms, it says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. All that we see in creation was done. Now, there are many that because of the atrocities and the iniquities of man doubt that there is a God. But to that, all we say is as believers, is then tomorrow you make the sun come up or not. Then show us your heavens that you have created. Then show us the waters uh, that you brought about out of nothing. Uh, show us that paintbrush that you line the heavens with, with all of the stars and the planets and with the galaxies, the multiple galaxies that we are still through science finding out exist. So all we're saying is no one to this point, 2017, has been able to recreate from nothing Anything that the creator has already made. That is the God that we are speaking of. The self-created one. The one by which everything that is exists. So when it speaks of he gathered the waters of the sea together as a heap. And he laid them up in the depth of his storehouses. It tells us that uh, the translation here uh, in the uh, uh, storehouses here is reflected. And one passage is in Job 38, 22. This is where God, the great I am that I am, is having a conversation with Job. And in verse 22, he lifts this parallel. That's uh, Job, the 38th chapter and the 22nd verse. And it reads, have you entered into the treasure, treasures of the snow? Now, the word treasures here is translated from in Psalms where it speaks of storehouses. So it goes on, it says, have you seen the treasures or the storehouses of the hell? Where, which, verse 23, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war. Now, also, we can read another uh, scripture here speaking of how the Lord uh, caused the waters to stand up as a heap, meaning to stand up right and not to flow. But this is also in Joshua, 
the third chapter, verses 13 through 16. And this is where uh, the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant and crossed the Jordan River on dry land. And again, it is an example of how the Creator caused His creation to serve His purpose and not its own purpose. But He caused the waters to stand up on a heap, to stand upright, so that the people of God could cross over on dry land into the land that God had promised unto them. So as we reflect and we look at why should we praise God? What has God done that requires that we should render praise unto God for it? First, let us look at, look at how we ourselves engage in practice of praise. When a child does something that is rewarding, uh, a child uh, colors within the lines, uh, a child reads a sentence from a book correctly, uh, a child uh, performs a certain act that we ask them to do in a home or a school setting or whatever the setting may be. We usually applaud the child to send a message to the child that what you just did was good, that uh, what you did warrants uh, applause, it warrants attention, uh, it was something that was rewarding. Uh, even as we mature and grow older, uh, even as employees uh, at different employers, uh, there are practices in place that if you complete a certain task or an assignment within a given amount of time, you are rewarded for those things. Well, as we can find within our little finite selves a way of rewarding for works that are done, then shouldn't we be inclined to give that same response to a God much greater than ourselves, to give unto God that which is worthy? Here's just a few examples that tell us how we can engage in the practice of worshiping. And it says we can worship him when we view a glorious sunset or a clear starry, starry night. When we gaze into the eyes of a newborn baby. When we calm our hearts for sleep or when we are awakened fresh for a new day. When we remember the many blessings God has laid in our pathways and in our lives, and when we consider the many things that he has for us in our future, these are just some of the normal, everyday blessings and mercies that we receive that warrant our praise and worship unto the one true God. As always, we hope that something that was said in our lesson has provided you insights into God's purpose for our lives, how we can better prepare ourselves to be servants for God, and most importantly, how we can fulfill God's will and purpose in our lives. The blessings of God be upon you as always is our prayer. God bless you and keep you. Amen.